Uh, Professor Chanti, thank you for uh, joining us to discuss the special section on the new European century. Um, the section is using the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended World War I as an opportunity to reflect on the past, the present and the future um, of Europe. So I was wondering if you could tell us what you think the key challenge facing Europe is right now and in terms of the crisis, how do you compare it to past challenges that the European continent has faced? I mean, I would say that the rationale for European integration uh, has uh, really changed over time. I mean, if you think about what rationale number one was, uh, the rationale for my parents' generation, it was peace on the continent after the end of World War II. Uh, so Europe was an ideal. Uh, perhaps it was an ideal of a few. Uh, indeed, it was always an elite project, let's face it. Uh, but it was a very powerful idea of those few that actually managed to materialize what uh, we now know as the European Union. Then rationale number two became a more utilitarian rationale about economic and, and social and, and other benefits. And, and this was basically the rationale, I think, for my generation. From uh, you know, Interrail as a teenager, uh, to uh, visa-free uh, travel, uh, to roaming uh, free charges, um, Europe is a luxury. I think the rationale for the European Union moving forward in the 21st century is really a more global rationale and it's really about Europe as a necessity. Uh, and I think it really has to do with the way in which broadly the world is changing. Uh, we're living through a world of global power shifts and power diffusion and power transmission in different shapes and forms. And the truth is that EU member states, taken individually, are all very small. Not only are they all very small, but they are all increasingly aware of the fact that they are all very small. And therefore, they may love or hate each other, and this goes to the conversation about you know, nationalist populism on the rise in Europe, but they increasingly understand that they need each other. So I think there is a fundamental shift in the rationale underpinning European integration in this historical uh, time frame. Just to pick up on what you're saying about European states and knowing that they're very small, and obviously there's one European state in particular which seems to be having a, going in a different direction and not necessarily recogni recognising its smallness. And the EU global strategy was, was launched within two days of the Brexit vote. And one of the things that um, the High Representative mentions in the product of your book on, on that topic is that it was seen as an opportunity for Europe to sort of represent itself as being strong um, and united. So I wonder, how do you see the Brexit process um, challenging what was set out in that vision for European yeah. global strategy? And how do you see that relationship between a post-Brexit UK and an EU moving forward together? Yeah. I mean, it, in terms of what the EU wants to achieve, uh, I don't think that Brexit um, made a huge difference. Uh, and I say this because if I think back at what the negotiations were uh, leading up to the EU global strategy, in which you try and always sort of, you know, take positions and make arguments in which there is a critical mass of member states essentially agreeing, and there is no one opposing. Mm -hmm. That's more or less the sort of two sets of criteria that, that, that you use. Interestingly, there was not one issue that I can think of uh, in which the UK was an, a real outlier in those two sets of dynamics. You know, maybe I would say Russia is one in which uh, the UK was very firmly on one end of the spectrum, but it was not alone. So I cannot actually think of anything that is in that strategy that would have been written differently in terms of what the EU wants to achieve uh, had the UK not participated in, uh, in, in the negotiations and the discussions. Now, of course, it's a very different set of questions if one says, well, what about the capability uh, of the European Union of achieving all this without the UK? And there I would say it's a story of lights and shadows, because on the one hand, particularly if we think about uh, security and defence, uh, yes, it's true that the UK is a very capable uh, member state, but not one that necessarily put its capability within an EU framework. Um, and the, on the other hand, uh, it was also a break uh, on a number of developments. And it's not a coincidence that many of the things that have happened since June 2016 happened because the result of the UK referendum was, uh, was what it was. 
Now, how to square these two in a, in a positive rather than in a negative uh, fashion, I think it's basically going to be a story about trying to forge a relationship, particularly on foreign and security policy, which is as close as possible uh, between the EU and the UK. I think this is the one area in the Brexit negotiation that does offer some hope because the bargaining power between the two sides is slightly more balanced as opposed to the rest of the Brexit negotiation, which does not um, promise very well. And so the main challenge is going to be one of uh, sort of forging a way so as to avoid the rest of the Brexit pollution uh, from polluting the area of foreign security policy as well. You mentioned the issue of capabilities there. One of the things that's been quite noticeable since the EGS was launched um, are the initiatives like PESCO and then the uh, European Intervention Initiative. How well do you feel they are moving towards bridging that capabilities gap and what do you think needs to be done in that context to, to bring the EU forward? I mean, I would say that it's a necessary beginning, uh, but we're still many, many years away from actually achieving the strategic autonomy that the EU has, or Europe, uh, has uh, sort of presented as, uh, as an objective. Uh, PESCO is, is an opportunity to the extent that it's a overall institutional framework that creates a set of institutional, legal and financial incentives for member states to cooperate, cooperate more systematically with one another. It has to be viewed, I think, in conjunction particularly with the European Defence Fund. And I think it's addressing a question uh, which has been there for a while. You know, sort of for a long time, we basically said, well, it doesn't make sense for Europeans not to cooperate on, uh, on defence. Uh, and this was a debate that particularly started sort of boiling up during the financial crisis, basically saying, you know, actually, also for reasons that have to do with efficiency, it makes sense for that cooperation to become more systematic. And the truth is that it never happened. So given that it doesn't happen naturally, one has to uh, insert some incentives. And I think, you know, the mechanisms that have been put in place over the last years are indeed a set of institutional, legal and financial incentives. Are these going to be sufficient? Who knows? Are they necessary? Absolutely. That's the great get-it cause, cause of, uh, you know, any, any academic is necessary in sufficient conditions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we need this, we don't know if it's really going to work. Um, and in terms of the European Intervention Initiative, because one of the tensions with PESCO when it was established was the Franco-German tension between the Germans who wanted a broad encompassing initiative and the French who wanted a narrow and much more more careful one, and to borrow a phrase from the Brexit negotiations, are, are the French having their cake and eating it with, with the E2I? I, I'm actually personally extremely sceptical uh, of the European Intervention Initiative, and um, I share the French concern of a PESCO that is too wide. Uh, I think that on paper, so far, PESCO has managed to square that circle between inclusivity and ambition, because on paper it is actually quite ambitious. I mean, if you compare the text uh, of the so-called 4 plus 4 letter uh, that originated the dynamic leading up to PESCO and the text of the council decision, the notification, they're not that different. So on paper, so far so good. In practice, it's a problem uh, if you have so many member states joining because what happens if not one defects, because if one defects you can easily uh, exclude them, what if five or six start defecting and they obviously start supporting one another? So I think the French do have a point. Now the reason why I'm sceptical about the European Intervention Initiative, uh, as it is, is that, at least in my personal experience, um, the truth is that institutions, they're deadly boring, they're slow, they are paper-producing machines, but without institutions, pure intergovernmental cooperation does not deliver. Uh, yes, you can have a nice uh, joint letter uh, between uh, a couple of ministers. Bilateral cooperation does, but if you're trying to do something which is more than bilateral, which at the very least includes six, seven, eight member states, you need to get the institutions there if you actually want to move beyond paper and interaction. I think they're up to 11 now, so I exactly. think that, that under, under, underscores that particular point. One of the big ideas in, in the EG, EUGS um, is this idea of principal pragmatism and I assume in some ways it's been criticised as being a concept that's a little bit woolly, a little bit too open to, to do interpretation. So what, what's your interpretation of that and how do you see that being, being delivered through the implementation of the EGS? I think it, um, 
Okay, I think there are two dominant interpretations in which one is uh, unfortunately, you hear it quite often and I think it's completely wrong, and then there is a second one. I think what you normally end up uh, hearing is principal pragmatism is basically the sort of, you know, a, a realist uh, sort of injection uh, into the normative power Europe that's, that we thought we once knew. I think I heard exactly that phrase on the panel yesterday. But. Right, exactly. <laughs> now, I think that is the wrong interpretation of, uh, of the term. I think um, the way in which I at least interpret it uh, is, is that of saying there needs to be a degree of pragmatism in the analysis, in the diagnosis of, uh, of a situation. Mm -hmm. So we need to remove our rose-tinted lenses in simply assuming that the rest of the world simply wants to become like us, that there are these uh, lovely linear processes of democratization and modernization and liberalization and all good things. All we have to do with uh, a bit of social learning, a bit of conditionality is help civilize others into becoming more like us. I mean, I'm slightly simplifying the argument here, but that is, I mean, one can take issue with that kind of argument from a more normative standpoint, but let alone the normative standpoint, it is simply factually wrong. <laughs> it simply has not happened. So the pragmatism is, in my view, in the diagnosis. The principles have to be in the prognosis, uh, in the what to do about this. But the principles have to be, I think, largely embedded into an understanding that we need to live up to our own principles uh, in the way in which we conduct foreign policy. So to take an obvious example, it is not about democracy promotion outside, it is living up to our own democratic principles in the way in which we conduct our external relations migration being a case in which this is obviously not <laughs> happening. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the difference between the old understanding, if you like, of what a normative foreign policy was and a uh, principal pragmatism interpretation of that is that there is a far greater degree of humility in assuming, you know, as I said, not assuming that the world necessarily is moving towards us. Um, and uh, so great, greater humility uh, greater indeed pragmatism and realism but not in you know in the sort of literal sense of the term assessment of, uh, of the world uh, but making sure that we need to know who we are in the way we approach that world. So as part of the challenge to living up to principal pragmatism then not just about the EU global strategy focus, focusing outwards but also about the EU focusing Maybe. inwards and the, the challenges that we have in and the the list of countries is getting larger now with, with, with Italy, Hungary, Poland um, and, and elsewhere. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's not a coincidence that, um, you know, the, the global strategy sort of starts off by outlining four basic interests of the EU. Three of those are internal interests. Uh, and to me, the most interesting one is democracy. So the way in which democracy as an interest is articulated is, as I was saying earlier, it's about living up to our own democratic principles before we even think about the rest of the world. Because unless we do our own internal homework, there's no way that we can do anything good outside. That, I suppose, brings us to connecting to the broader question of the West and the transatlantic relationship. Um, historically, the, the European Union and Europe more broadly has dealt with a, a positive partner on the other side of the Atlantic, whether that was actively underwriting um, our security, or at least not actively trying to undermine um, our, our security <laughs> and our interests. Um, and in that context, how do you see the challenge of the Trump, Trump presidency in particular, and to what extent does that reflect of, of broader changes, or is it just a, a blip in, in history? I personally don't think it's a blip, uh, because I think that Trump is the symptom of a structural change within the United States, and uh, it's about a structural change of the United States in uh, the broader world. I think that Trump is a, uh, an extreme version of what a post-imperial uh, US president uh, is. Um, and I think that Europeans are having a hard time waking up to this, this reality. I think we necessarily have to wake up to this reality. I think there's the beginning of this, but we're still sort of halfway, not even halfway through that journey. I think it's a largely speaking a psychological step that Europeans need to, to take in recognizing that actually we need to become adults uh, and we cannot simply outsource our security to someone else. 
because why should they be looking after us? You know, we are rich, you know, we're prosperous, we're, and compared to most parts of the world, there is no reason why there'd be someone else having to look after our own security. But it's a big psychological step to take because, you know, past generations have been used to a completely, to a relationship which is ultimately based on dependence. Um, it will mean facing up to questions that since the end of World War II we have not resolved. Uh, and I think question number one is the quote-unquote German question. Uh, and in many respects it's harder to solve that question today after the Eurozone crisis, etc., than it was perhaps, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. Because ultimately, I mean, let me give you the most extreme case, uh, case of all, if it is about looking after our own security, what does this imply in terms of nuclear? Um, and what kind of questions does this open up about Germany? Uh, so I think there are a number of issues with, which, you know, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to take this psychological step not only for practical material reasons, but for really deeply embedded historical reasons. Mm. But we have no choice. We simply have to start confronting those questions because uh, the United States, Trump or no Trump, for, per for perfectly legitimate reasons, will simply be casting its gaze elsewhere. I I'm really interested in this concept of the, the post-imperial presidency. And do you think that the, I suppose, the bombastic nature of Trump is distracting people or perhaps even giving them an, an easy get out from addressing these more difficult questions? Um, I think that, you know, I think that the, the, the main way in, I mean, if one thinks about, you know, what does a post-imperial president uh, mean, entail? What does a post-imperial administration entail? I think it's, it's mainly about recognizing that the United States either cannot take Obama or does not want to take Trump, uphold a system which is greater than itself. Uh, the, the, the tragedy with Trump is that uh, because it's a question not of an appreciation of what he can or cannot do, but rather it is the outcome of what he does, he wants or does not want to do, he has no interest in upholding that system. He thinks that system is flawed. Hmm? Uh, and, but at the same time, he knows that um, the United States remains, at this point in time, still the most powerful actor in that system. And so he is willing to extract as much benefit from it, take trade, take climate, take security, etc., even at the risk of breaking it, breaking NATO, breaking Paris, uh, uh, breaking the WTO. So the, the, the question that we have to sort of ask ourselves is, can we do enough? And this goes back to principal pragmatism. Can we do enough with others? You know, let's get out of this mindset of assuming that the like-minded is a sort of, you know, well-defined group of member states, there will be issues on which, in order to preserve that system and transform it, huh, but to somehow pre preserve that system, we will have to work with uh, actors that in many respects are not very like-minded. To preserve the JCPOA, we have to work with the Russians and the Chinese. Um, on other issues, there will be different configurations of actors that we have to, to, to work with. In order, you know, if we cannot count on Trump's America to uphold the system, we have to learn how to work more creatively, pragmatically uh, with others while living up to our own principles in order to transform that system while at the same time upholding it. And do you think that um, European leaders at the moment are recognising this fundamental change, that this genie is out of the bottle now? Or do we have run that risk of, you know, generals always fighting the last war, our political leaders are trying to rebuild a political order that simply isn't viable or feasible? You know, I think these, uh, these processes are never linear. So it's, it's always about, you know, one step forward, two step backwards. Um, so it is about, you know, uh, Heiko Maas, German foreign minister, saying we need to create an alternative system to SWIFT and uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, saying uh, the opposite uh, two days later. But the debate has started. There's, be, there's even a debate about uh, nuclear power in Germany, which has picked up again. Uh, incredible if you think about it. So I think the debate is, is starting. Uh, but as I said, because it's a big psychological step for Europeans to take, we cannot expect it to be either fast or linear. Uh, but I think it's begun. I so to bring this back out to the, the broader historical context, which this section is addressing, I was struck by the two histories of the 20th century. There's Eric Hobsbawm's Age of Extremes, which is the short 20th century from 1914 to 1989, and Mark Mazur's Europe's 20th century, which he calls Dark Continent. 
And just to ask you to speculate about the next 100 years, if a historian is sitting down to write the history of 21st century Europe, how do you think we're going to be described? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, the answer to that question will really depend on the way in which Europeans exit uh, the wave that we're currently in. Uh, and I think it's a wave, you know, if you think about sort of nationalist populism as a 21st version, perhaps, of national socialism, mm -hmm. um, it is about a political trend within Europe, and not obviously confined to Europe, which I think is also related to a broader structural shift going on in the international system. Um, you know, sometimes, um, sort of, I think back again, going back to the 1920s, to uh, a great quote by Antonio Gramsci, which sort of translated from Italian means something along the lines of, uh, you know, the old order is dying, the new order is yet to be born, and in that, period of lights and shadows that is the time of monsters so we have our monsters uh, at home in europe and i think they are intricately connected to the transition that we're undergoing in the international system so the question really is whether and how we will exit this wave and what kind of lasting damage it will make uh, when it comes to to Europe and to the, to the to the fabric, basically both institutional, political, social, etc., uh, of uh, of the European European polity. Um, I remain cautiously optimistic uh, to the extent that, and I go back to this, you know, rationale of European integration in the twenty first century as being a necessity. You know, if we are moving in a world in which, you know, whether one calls it multipolar, interpolar, nonpolar, whatever but it's gonna be different, structurally speaking, to what we've had so far. It is clear that Europeans, you kinda of need to be a continental-sized power to sort of uh, engage in that kind of world. And I think there's growing realization that we need to stick together in order to protect our, our interests, our values, and what have you, is going to be the glue, if you like, of the 21st century. So that is the, the cause for optimism. The cause for pessimism is that I do think, you know, it goes back to the point make, you know, I was making about Trump. This is not a bit, whether it's Trump, whether it's Salvini, whether it's, uh, you know, we have all, unfortunately plenty of, of examples, so that, that that blip will have a lasting consequence. Uh, so it's about, you know, what will be the balance between that lasting damage and the necessity of sticking together. And on that note of searching for the past, I have to thank you very much for your time. Thank uh, you. We'll close it there.